As you're just settling in, I'll tell you one more story about uh, dad, mom and dad, and then we'll get going. And we'll start with uh, questions that you might have. We'll do that first. But I said that my dad was the quietest man who ever lived. And of course, somebody should say, how quiet was he? You know, like the old John, oh, there, thank you. Well, Holly already knows this story's coming. My mom and dad went after church on Sunday to the same restaurant, the only restaurant in our little 800 person town. And they had essentially the same meal from the same waitress cooked by the same cook you can see where this is going and, and such. But being very quiet, when the waitress would come over, and one time we were with them, my, Holly and I and the kids, and the waitress came over and got our, our orders. She got, came around, can you just be my mom just for a second? And she, she said, so Linda, what do you want? And my mom said, oh, I think I'll have this and this and this and this and this. And she then looked at my dad, so Edwin, and immediately my mother said, oh, Edwin will have the meatloaf <laughs> and the green beans and, uh, and, and, and still early, so we can have coffee and we'll see about the pie later. Well, when we got home, I said to mom, well, mom, why didn't you let dad order? And mom said, oh, he doesn't want to order. He doesn't want to say anything. Well, how do you know that he wants the meatloaf? I said, oh, Dan, she said, oh, Danny, he wants the meatloaf. I just, he just knows. So my dad would not order. So to prove her point, the next week we were home back in Butternut and we called my mom. We always talked on Sunday afternoons and mom said, so I did what you told us. So what was that, ma? Well, when we went to Eagles, it's Eagles Cafe. When we went to Eagles, I didn't order for Dad. I said, so what did Dad have? Nothing. He didn't say a word. He got no meal. My mother would not order for him. My mother had a meal, and he had nothing. And if that doesn't prove, he is the quietest man, because he couldn't even say meatloaf. I mean, that, that is Dad. Dad is a very quiet man. All right. Now, and don't you want to know that in heaven, wouldn't this be now what we should have, is when you go to heaven... You'll meet a very outgoing, lively, talking woman right at the gates, drinking coffee and asking who you are and filling up. And then if you say, oh, I know your son, Danny, she'll say, oh, was he any good? And then you can say, oh, he was all right, Linda. Oh, good. And that would be my mother. And my dad is somewhere in the back of the back of the shop working on the chariot wheels or something, you know. Uh, but wouldn't it be something if dad is sitting at the front gates welcoming you and is the lead of the praise band? That'll never happen, but... Uh, there you go. George had a wonderful thought, and uh, I bet you not alone in saying there might be questions after our opening, and let's do that. If, if there are any questions now, and maybe, um, well, we're, oh, Steve's coming around with the mic, and uh, we'll do this also at the end. You know, I'll not only turn you loose to talk, but uh, that's a great idea. So, uh, George, Steve is coming up on you right now. Questions? Uh, I had one question, and I'd, I'd always thought of the... Uh the Lord's Prayer as a template. Okay. A template. Yes. I, don't, I don't know why. We just yes. uh, don't know where that idea came from. Sure. But probably in church somewhere. <laughs> just probably a wild a, guess. Yeah, confirmation. But, uh, yeah, but, church. you know, just uh, acknowledging who we, who, we, uh, who we are speaking to and right. how, he, how he wants us to call him. Right. And, uh, and offering him praise and f f being thankful that he's making the decisions and we're not. Absolutely. And then asking for what we need. It just right. seems like a template to me. It does. And it really incorporates those key elements that yeah. I think come into our mind. Praise to God. So is it intended right. as a template? Or? I think so. And I would say it's intended as a foundation on which we can build, on which we can grow. Like, for instance, if I, if I may, and, and again, pastors, I'm, there's about three pages in the book on this, but I'm going to mine a little out of it and uh, woe to the whichever gets this one. Hallowed be thy name. What name of God is especially important to you today? I mean, think of all the names by which he is known. And when we say, hallowed be thy name, haven't you just expanded like a fan a whole panoramic view of who is this God? Who do you need his name to be today? Friend of sinners. Well, that's always good. Savior, Lord, Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor, and we could go on, couldn't we? They're all good. But I think that's a wonderful place to, to pause. Now, Pastor Jeff, and uh, when you're doing the Lord's Prayer up front, don't pause 20 minutes, you know, for us to think about that, you know. But isn't that a place where you do pause when you're saying it yourself? Or, let's admit it, you kind of stay there yourself while others keep going with the rest of the prayer because you're thinking through which name is it that I really need. So I think, George, a template or it's a foundation we build on 
those foundation pieces as they come along. And they'll change it. It changes from one day to another. Yeah, is there another question? Here, this, this young man. So when the disciples asked um, Jesus, yeah. teach us to pray, do right. you think that they really were expecting to get the actual words yes. rather than like structure or order or what to pray for? What to pray for. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a wonderful question. And wouldn't we love to run up and say, what were you looking for? What did you hear or want to hear? As John taught his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the Luke chapter 11 context. Um, by the way, a little footnote from I. Howard Marshall, who noted that this is the only time that the disciples ask for a spiritual ability or gift. Now, they're sent out. They're, taught, they're told to teach and to heal. And remember, they come back telling that they heal others, they cast out demons. But we don't have any instruction on that. The only instruction that they ask for is, teach us to pray. Isn't that a wonderful thought? If you and I come up with the same basic idea or question, we're right there with them. So what did they expect? I think that maybe the permission to say words similar to what Jesus was saying, they'd overheard him praying to the Father. And that's where I think I'd go with that opening idea that can we really drive the car at 14? Well, in this case, God really does give us words probably that echo what Jesus said to the Father and says, you can say these. Isn't that amazing? You and I can put on God's own words, and they fit. When David went to battle Goliath, Saul tried to have him put on Saul's armor, and it wouldn't fit. But we can wear the very words of God and they fit. Isn't that an amazing difference? We'd be imposters if he didn't allow us and give us that permission. Isn't that amazing? When you were, Ed, Ed you're so handy. Ed, when you were a little boy, at some point you went over and, and took a, a suit coat out of dad's closet and you tried it on, right? How'd that fit? Poorly. Poorly, not so good. You're know, sort of drowning in it. And yet the words of God don't cause us to drown. They somehow fit without being outworn 60 years later when we're old and that's the one words we can hear and still say. And by the way, can I, can I, this, isn't that a marvelous thing? I know that you've known people a little bit advanced in age, maybe those who have gone through some uh, loss, uh, like a stroke, and they've lost maybe memory, they've lost some of their conversation abilities, but as a pastor, and I know pastors, you, you've had the same experience so many times, but if you say the Lord's Prayer with them, they can say the Lord's Prayer. Isn't that remarkable? I had a gentleman who had a got advanced age, he had a stroke. He reverted to saying it in German because that's how he had grown up with it. He never spoke German otherwise. But after the stroke, that unser Vater, and off he went. As I was saying in English, trust me, uh, saying in English. Isn't that wonderful? So we never outgrow the words, but they never swamp us as children. Isn't that a remarkable thing? The elasticity of God's words outdoes anything we wear. Any other questions? Oh, you're so much better than my students. My students, the only question is, is this on the test? That's the totality of their questions usually, and so nothing more. All right, we've got uh, one, two, three, uh, and this is just perfect. Our time is just perfect for this. Uh, expectations that we might bring to God when we do pray. And uh, there are many, I think, in terms of our imaging of God and our relationship with him, and we try to compact some of that in the words of the Lord's Prayer, of course, uh, from our Father right on. And one of the first that I'm going to hold up for us, we're right in the middle here, what are the expectations we bring in our prayers? One of the, the first is instant perfection and patient relationship, and for that I need to tell you a, a story, as you would guess. Um, my dad was a mechanic in the U.S. Army uh, from World War II, 1942, and was discharged in late 45. He grew up on a farm in western Minnesota, and after the war, went right back to that farm, and then bought the farm next to it, and that's where I grew up. So my dad, except for the U.S. Army, spent his entire life in one square mile. Uh, 80-acre farm and then our 200-acre farm next door. And so my dad's whole life was turning wrenches, running the farm. 
And our whole relationship, my dad and I, was work. And as I said, very silent work. Uh, dairy farm was simple, and, and the work was uh, straightforward. And I wouldn't say that I was really close to my dad, because it, it's really hard to be close to someone Nothing. I mean, this does not speak. Uh, and and so, so when Dad retired from active farming, and we knew that was coming, he sold the, the farm machinery in 1990. Uh, he was 73 at the time, so he, he worked a long time in that. Uh, when Dad was just about going to retire, I thought, well, what are we going to do, Dad and I? You know, there's no combining to do or any, you know, any work. We would run back to the farm. Holly was most wonderful. We had one week vacation, and we spent it combining oats on the farm uh, in Minnesota, and that was our vacation. Uh, and and says, so well, what are we going to do? So I got this crazy idea, because I like turning wrenches also. What if we restored a Model T Ford. And the reason I chose a Model T is that we had remnants of the very first Ford uh, Model T that our family had, or my father's family had, 1915 Ford. And there were a few remnants of it, hubcap here, a cowl there, tail lamp and such. I thought, well, I wonder if I could find one. And it's a very simple car, you probably know. And uh, what if Dad and I could work on it together? And so my dad said, well, yeah, sure. You know, well, no, he wouldn't have said that much. He would have said, yes. That would have been dad. Uh, or he would have my mother say, say yes. Oh, by the way, when the phone rang and dad was sitting, you know, having coffee next to the phone, he would not pick up the phone. He would absolutely not pick up the phone. My mother would have to come down from upstairs and answer the phone. And she would have a few comments about the whole thing as she went by. You could answer the phone. Like, that's going to happen, Mom. That's never going to happen. And, and so, so we went out and we bought a 1917 Model T. I'm going to pass around the pictures. And I'll start here with Pastor Jeff. And please make sure they work out. Do give them back, please. This is what we found in a farmer's yard just outside Ashland, Wisconsin. We, that's where we live, just outside of Ashland. And it had sat for 35 years uncovered in northern Wisconsin weather. And there it sat, a sad little piece of tin. Uh, 1917, here's the story. It was delivered there originally in 1917 to that family. The grandfather of the man I bought it from was its first and only owner. It's a one owner Model T. $250, but when you see how it looks, you can see why we got it for $250. It was just a piece of junk. By the way, there were a few assorted pieces uh, elsewhere on the farm, and we found a little here, a little there, a little tin here, a little there, and, and such. So Dad and I worked on it for four years, putting it together, and at the end of four years, oh, here's Dad and me uh, driving it uh, in Butternut. And by the way, when you live in a 400-person town in the Northwoods, you can put a frame, an engine, and throw a box and sit on it and drive all around town, and the county sheriff lived two blocks away and didn't care. That's northern Wisconsin. I don't think you could probably do that here. If it was a golf cart, maybe you could in uh, Hilton Island, but a Model T, maybe not. After four years, this is what we ended up with, and we got it all done, and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. We, we loved working on it together. We enjoyed that so much. Guess what we did after we fixed up that one? We bought a Model A. Here's a 1930 Model A two-door sedan. We paid $700 for this one, way overpriced, because they said the engine had been overhauled. No, 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 it really wasn't. And uh, so we worked on this one for four more years, and after four years, here's the Model A. Dad and I did this together, and Dad took the Model A, and I took the Model T, and Dad drove it, and then finally, you know, I understand, Dad's eyesight and such where he couldn't drive anymore, and so sold the Model A. That's fine, I didn't have room for it, and I still have, we still have the Model T, and it looks just like that, and we were driving it uh, a week ago, and, or two weeks ago, no, yeah, two weeks ago, because we were traveling last week, and uh, it's a hand crank, I mean, it's all original. It, it is, you have to hand crank it, it because there was no starter in 1917 and such. So here's my question to you. Uh, well, there's, there's kind of uh, the, the, the question is uh, restoring the Model T. Uh, you can buy any part for a Model T except for a crankcase, a crankshaft, and a frame. 
But since Henry Ford made 15 million of them, those are not hard to find. There are crankcases, crankshafts, and mop frames all over the country, and, and they're for like nothing. Cheap, 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 cheap. You can go to a catalog and buy anything else. You want fenders? You want fenders? We got fenders. They'll ship them out of Texas. You'll have them three days. They're perfect. You know, you want, you name it, you want upholstery? We got upholstery. And we, by the way, we, we bought the upholstery kit and we put it in, and, and, and. You can buy any part. And I'm proud to say that every part on our Model T is genuine Henry Ford original sheet metal. But where do we find it? Because you saw the pictures. There's a whole lot of pieces missing. We had an epic day, Dad and I, it was 10 below zero, that's air temperature, not, not wind chill, 10 below air temp, and we went around to a number of farms that we knew had old car parts, and we dug parts out of the snow banks. I remember we pulled those fenders and running boards out from under a semi-truck, a semi-trailer, and we found them, and we were so excited. 10 below. Did you notice the two words that make no sense? What an oxymoron. My dad, excited. I just wanted you to think about that. <laughs> and willing at 10 below to spend a day doing this. And remember, Dad's an older man. He's in his early 70s when we're doing this. And what a joy that really was. So why do we do it? Instant perfection or something else? Is our car perfect? No, Gladys, you're absolutely right. You can take it to any car show and put it next to the cars that are done professionally by body men who only do cars. And every, every show in the world that uh, deals with this, uh, My Dream Car, if you ever watch My Dream Car, ours would not look like that. We're uh, two, farm, uh, two farm boys, basically, you know, uh, two farmers, and we did all the spray painting in our garage, and uh, we're not perfect. So why did we do it? If we weren't going for perfection, why did we waste our time building these two cars? They cost us $2,000 in the end. Each car cost about 2,000 in parts because we did all the work ourselves. Gladys, why did we do it? Relationship. Relationship, exactly. What happened when suddenly every week I would call mom and dad, well, we never talked to dad because mom answered, but after I talked to mom for a couple of minutes, what did I, what, what was the rest of the conversation? With dad. In fact, my mother said, I suppose you want to talk to dad. He's standing right here and he wants the phone. Do you realize how, I don't. Is that, my father wants to talk on the phone. Now, what do we talk about? The car, exactly. My dad never talked about deep, deep feel. How are you feeling, Danny? He did not care, you know. Oh, he cared, but my, my dad was a generation that didn't ask you that, you know. But did you get that fender pounded out yet? That he wanted to know, and because he's working on the other one. And, and such, it was an amazing thing. So we went not for instant perfection, patient relationship. Think about that. You can get instant perfection. Well, relatively instant. Deliver that old car to any body man, any restorer, write a humongous check, which by the way would be far more than the car is worth. These aren't really that expensive. That car as you're looking at it today, you can buy a Model T like that for $6,000. Restored, done, like ours. That's, they're not expensive. But if you're, not, if you're going for instant perfection, you can just write a check and that's what you get. Patient relationship is something different. So let me ask. What are you looking for? What's your expectation of your father when you go to him in prayer? Are you looking for a God of instant perfection or a God of patient relationship? And because we're Lutherans, we love both and questions because the answer is yes to both, isn't it? Do we have a God who could give us instant perfect answers? Absolutely. We don't have to go there, but does Genesis 1 kind of suggest something on this line? How long does it take God to get what he wants when he sets about creating the world? Six days. And when he says, he speaks, let there be light, boom, there's light. And how did it turn out? Perfect, good, good. So when you start like that, when you start like that, aren't you starting with an expectation of, I've got an instant, perfect God. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Does he continue to do instant perfect miracles and answers? 
Dave, Dave, you're a wonderful guy, and I hope you're the picture of health. But could you be just a leper for just a second for me? You know, you're a leper. Now look at that. Laura's already saying that. I knew it. I knew it. it was, I know. There was that mole over here that you've been worried about. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll come back to you after I, you know. But Dave, you're that wonderful leper that cries out for mercy, and Jesus touches the leper, and how, how, how fast? Instantly, how well? And you can move back, Laura. Now, he's okay. He's good. And, and, and was he okay the next morning? And you better believe he was wondering. Can you imagine going to sleep that night and you'd look a thousand times? It's, it sure looks good. And what are you going to do first thing when you wake up? Exactly. And every day thereafter. Are there other instant perfect answers that come to mind in the, in the ministry of Jesus? Oh, what else? Lazarus, come forth. But Gladys, I'm going to hold that one at both and. Because when did the sisters want that healing to come? Immediately. As soon as, as, soon as we let you know. So, exactly. I mean, they're as impatient as when you send a text to somebody and they don't respond for four days. Really? What's going on? Why do we even have you have a phone? Uh, and it says every parent has said that. Why do we have you have a phone if you're not going to answer our text? Exactly. Are there other instant perfect moments in which Jesus... Which one? Water to wine. Isn't that a perfect one? Once the water's here, it's wine. And there's no poof or laser light show or anything like that. It simply is. Are there other instant perfect moments that you say, of course. Feeding 5,000, isn't that perfect? Line them up, sit them down, and it never stops. And he just keeps on breaking and giving and amazing, and it never ends. Even to the last group in the very back, like the worst wedding reception you ever went to, and you're in the back, and yes, we've all been there. Having to, you know, t table 79. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, were at, we were at a wedding so long, you're not getting it. I trained my students. How long was the way? How long was the way? So we were at the back of the back of the back of the back. And they started serving at 6.30. Our food came at quarter to eight. And the people from the head table were all walking around. And every one of them walked by and says, you haven't eaten yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you ought to say, really? God, no, I, God, never noticed. <laughs> I don't know. Never, never noticed. Fortunately, we were friends. So we just talked. It, it was all good. So we have instant perfection in the mind, in the ability of Jesus. And we can keep on going. There are other ones. How about instant perfection of transfiguration? And he shone like the sun. And how good was it? Perfect. In fact, the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Let's go with instant perfect as our hope when we pray. Would you like to have an instant perfection answer when you pray? And but remember, we're Lutherans, so we love to, we're both and people. Yes, we would. Why would you love an instant perfect answer when we pray? And it makes perfect sense. I, and it, exactly. I wouldn't be asking if I didn't want it. And if it wasn't maybe important. Right? Keep on going. When would, why would you like an instant perfect answer? When we pray, think about anything. It could be an illness. It could be a problem in the family. It could be an opportunity that hasn't come. It could be a decision you have to make and you want to know when, now. What, what, why do you want an instant perfect answer? Oh, yes, this young lady. We are impatient. Because, by the way, have you been waiting for this answer for a while? This isn't something you just came up with this morning. This is something you've been asking and asking and asking for, why else do we want an instant, perfect answer when we pray? Yeah, Ed. Yeah, I believe in you, God. Wouldn't that be a wonderful reason for you to do what I ask? You'd think that'd be a lever big enough to move God into action. And by the way, not only maybe did I say, I believe in you, God, I told everybody in the world what you're going to do. That's an even bigger lever, isn't it? At least in our minds. Why else? Think about that leper the next morning. What, why does he want a perfect answer? Does he want the leper seek to come back? 
No, no. By the way, here's another one. Remember the woman who had the bleeding for 12 years and she touched Jesus and said, if I just touch him, I'll be well. You think about that poor woman for 12 years waking up every morning hoping and hopes dashed. That she had any hope left after 12 years. Don't you want to just salute her and give her a medal? Because I think hope would have been crushed out of me long before that. I remember she went to every doctor, no offense to all our doctor friends, but she went to every doctor she could find and got no better. Wouldn't that have just ruined any hope that you had, taken it away? And she had this slim hope if I touch him. That next morning, just like we did with the leper, don't you imagine she woke up wondering and was well. What a marvelous thing. And every morning after, can you imagine her waking up? It is well. So does God give instant perfect answers to our prayers? Let's think about the Lord's Prayer. And I won't be treading on your turf here, fellas. But are there parts of the Lord's Prayer that speak to an instant perfection? Where when you ask for it, it is so. It is. There is right now, and that truth is. There's more than one. What parts of the Lord's Prayer are there is? There's a young lady in the back. <laughs> Thy will be done. Thy will be done. You, you don't have to ask God, now, wouldn't you like to have your way on this one, God? <laughs> As though, yeah, God, you're going to do your will. So the yet to be done is align my thoughts and vision to match what you're going to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, sir. This is fine, young man. What else is instant and perfect already in the prayer? Go. Forgive us our trespasses. Do you have to wait? Is that, a, is that an incremental? No. Is there a conditional on that? Not at all. Pastors are smiling. Isn't that one of our chief themes is there is no conditional if you're good enough, if you give enough, if you work hard enough, if you shape up, if you match Bob over there. There's no incremental or conditional when he says, or when we say, forgive us, it is. It is forgiven. We're reminding ourselves of what already is. Hallowed be thy name. Is it hallowed? Doesn't that sound like catechism? His name is already holy in itself. But why do we pray for? That it might be holy among us also. But is his name already true? We don't have to prop him up to become friend of sinners, wonderful counselor, mighty God. When we say those words in our mind, we're not saying, God, I hope someday you become these things. You are instant, lasting, perfect. That's a wonderful idea, isn't it? We could just stop right there and have an instant, perfect God. And we ask, and we get the answer. So why do we have it linger a little longer? Let's go to Paul. You, you see my note there? Paul in the flesh, thorn in the flesh. If you have a Bible... Would somebody be so kind? Let's run to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would somebody be so kind and read verses 7 to 10? And maybe Steve will get you on the mic. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. Somebody's got it. No, oh, this young lady, Steve. There, there you go. So, second. Okay. Corinthians, uh, chapter 2, 7 through 10. Ch uh, chapter 12? 10 through 12. Chapter 12. Oh, sorry. That's all right. There we go. And it's 7. It's here. Verses 7. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So to keep me. To each is given the no, manifestation no. of the Spirit for the common good. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 12. We're on 2 Corinthians. Oh. There we go. Yeah. That's yes, so many Corinthians. Oh, that's good. Yeah, 1152. Second, 2 Corinthians. Thank you. 
So Paul's vision and his thorns. So this right. is second crush. Uh, right, and then we're down to verses seven, seven. To, to ten. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. Paul wanted instant perfection, didn't he? In fact, he would want that instant perfection an answer of taking the thorn out. How quickly? Yeah, prayer one. Wouldn't you say prayer one? Three times, just as soon get it done the first time and be done with it. So what lesson did he learn about patient relationship as you look at those, those words from Paul and from God? Why would God say, I'm going to leave it that way? I'm going to leave that thorn in. And by the way, we don't know what the thorn is. It could be a physical ailment. Many suggest maybe eyesight problems still, epilepsy, malaria. Some suggest just a, a, a burdened conscience because of the you know, deaths that he caused. We don't know what the thorn is. But at least at the time of his writing, it's still there. Was it ever taken out? We don't know. But Paul seems to have a new perspective on it. What changed? What did Paul learn or what was he given through the patient relationship that came even as the thorn still was still there? What? Whatever happens, I'm content because when I am weak, then you are strong. Then I'm strong. I'm strong because I'm with whom? I'm with you. If you get what you want from God, you get an instant answer from God, is there any reason to stay? No, you got the heavenly vending machine, you went up, you put in your prayer token, you got what you wanted, and what do you do after you've gotten what you want out of a vending machine? You move on, you eat it, you drink it, you take it, you're gone. Is that a patient relationship? No, that's just a, I got what I wanted, and I'm out of here. Is that what God is after? Not at all. God is after a relationship of my strength, your weakness, carrying on. What I am, you're not. Let's find that kind of a match, and that's exactly what God carries on with us. That's an amazing change. So what do we ask for when we pray? Both and, don't we? Don't we ask those that, Lord, if we're sick, could you heal me? Isn't that part of daily bread? Not just bread and water or, or whatever to drink, but clothing, health, all those things. If you're lacking good health, don't you want that healing right now? Absolutely. But what if God doesn't break that instant healing next morning? Then we're the opposite of the leper, in, in a, but in a good way. If the leper woke up, or if that woman woke up the next day, remember the one who had the bleeding, and if the leprosy was back or the bleeding was back, how would she feel about Jesus? How would he feel about Jesus? Not good, not good. It was, all, ah, it was all a deception. It was a delusion. Everybody can have one good day. And then the old reality comes back. We're the opposite, aren't we? What if tomorrow morning the problem is still there? How do you feel about Jesus? If you're Paul at this point. It's okay. Because you're with me. One of the hallmarks, and I'm sure the pastor will talk about this or talk about it again, theology of the cross is one of our Lutheran hallmarks. And if I could just, and I know I'm doing it an injustice to bring it down to this, but theology of the cross basically says, when we're in trouble, the question we ask is, where do I find God even in this time, even in this place, when this place isn't instant perfect? In fact, it's very far from it. But theology of the cross says God is here. He was on the cross bearing my sins. He's here with us even when the thorn is still here. 
And that's really our prayer in so many cases. Lord, show me where you are, even here, even while this is still going on. That's his relationship. Isn't that a wonderful idea that God gives us a patient relationship and then puts an arm around our shoulders and says, well, it's the last image here, and then, oh, perfect. And we'll have time for questions. I've got a question or two here, but we'll go to questions after this. Um, Mom and Dad would come to visit. We, we live in Butternut. We were 330 miles from the farm in Minnesota, and uh, so Mom and Dad would come and drive across Minnesota and into Wisconsin to visit us. And Mom, we, we had grandchildren, we have the three children, so Mom would spend some time with the grandchildren. My dad did basically nothing with children. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, how do we have a picture? Oh, we have a picture of him holding Steve, I think, once in his little overalls, didn't we? You know? And, I, and Dad's trying to drink a cup of coffee coffee and, and unload this kid as fast as he can on somebody. My, my dad was not a nurturing person, uh, you know. And, and in fact, uh, I used to uh, want him to read books. My mother said dad would come in for coffee and just refuse to sit down because if I, he sat down, I would come over and have him read a book. He did not want to read a book. He wanted to drink coffee and go back to the shop. So dad would come in, but it changed with the Model T and the Model A. Changed when I got older. Uh, changed when dad was kind of retired, a little more mellow. So in the morning, he would come down. Oh, you have to picture dad, bib overalls, osh gosh, big gosh, bib overalls, blue chambray shirt, engineer boots, right? Old, old Funks G hybrids cap. That's a seed cordon company. I don't know if you know Funks G. Uh, and he would get a cup of coffee, and he'd say the best words ever. So Danny... What are we going to work on today? Oh. Dad's been gone since 04. I'd trade any day for a day with Dad saying, so Danny, what are we going to work on today? Did it matter what we worked on? Couldn't care less. Let's rebuild a carburetor. Let's pound out a fender. Let's go look for some parts. Let's, I, don't care. Isn't that a great picture of our Heavenly Father? Every morning, picture your Heavenly Father with a cup of coffee and put an arm around your shoulder and saying, so, what are we going to work on today? And in that patient relationship, he's not saying, if you show up and if you do well and if you keep all your promises. There's no if. And there's no until I find someone better or more interesting you have his full attention all day. Isn't that a beautiful picture? At least it is to me. We can't go back and have mom and dad as we wanted and, and, and hope for now, you know. Oh, we'd all say one more day as the old country song goes. But we have every single day that with our Heavenly Father. Every single day. He says, so what should we work on today? And by the way, I, I, I'll give you just a shorthand list if you're kind of thinking, well, what would that be? How about fruits of the Spirit? The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, the beauty of that list is why would it ever have to go down? So many of our abilities change as we get older. We don't run as we used to. We don't climb as we used to. We don't remember as we, we can go on and on. Your golf score keeps going up, you know, you don't hit the ball like you used to. Pastor Jeff still does, but, you know, uh, others not so much. You know, let's face it, so many of the abilities we peaked at are on a decline. That's just how it is. Why this? Why would God ever say that's the same trajectory for the fruits of the Spirit? Instead, he says love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He's never going to say to you at whatever age you are, no more love for you. You've had, all, you've had your quota. Done. No more peace. No more joy. Oh, isn't that a marvelous thought? And I just wonder sometimes, because I love this image, each day, what is it that God says, so Danny, what should we work on today? Which one of those things is especially today? Do you need to be reminded of, or maybe practice, or to simply be reassured by? And that's the gifts of a patient relationship father, and we all have one.
So you don't have to restore a Model T and uh, Model A or anything like that. You don't have to have a mechanic for a father or uh, anything like that. We have a patient relationship already with a wonderful father who can do instant things. And we're all for it when that happens. And part of our prayer is instant. It's there already. But a whole lot is still patient relationship from a giving father who's guiding us out of danger and taking us home. All right. Questions. We have perfect time for questions. Questions. And we're going to stay till 11, so you might as well have questions because there's no getting out early. I've, I've been a teacher for 26 years. I know that look. I know that look. We're staying here, people. Yeah, see, there you go. So we might as well have an interesting question from a young lady over here. Mm -hmm. It's actually more of a statement. I still prefer the heavenly vending machine. <laughs> we all want that first. Don't we want to come up with a token and say, will this work? I'm going to try this again today. Let's just see if this will work. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes God surprises us with a, oh, my gosh. You know, an answer that we kind of did want. And there it is. Exactly. Uh, Holly will get, uh, tell, tell you this. I don't really like to fly. I'm not afraid of flying. I just don't like the lines, the hassle, the uncertainty. And you, you know where I'm going? And I got to tell you, where's Gladys? Gladys? And Gladys will be my witness here that when we got the, the thing that said, Southwest has canceled our flight, I was. <laughs> we get to drive. <laughs> Honey, load up the car. We're going. And, you know, and by the way, none of that, I wonder, can we take this or that? I took my winter coat. Jeff said, I don't think you're going to need a coat. I took a coat, people, because we drove, by gully. And we're from Wisconsin, and you need a coat 12 months of the year. Yeah. Not fooling me. <laughs> Steve. So, uh, good doctor. Um, you know, I think it's, I, I appreciated Pat's comment. Um, so when you think about the family prayer and the, um, and the family and, you know, world religions, you know, oh. you, you and I have both taught this yes. for students. <laughs> and would it be too strong of a statement to say that this notion of patient relationship is somewhat unique yeah. when you talk about the relation, the other teachings of relationship of the divine and the mortal. Absolutely. Would, would you speak to that? Absolutely. And by the way, a pastor just barely hinted at the fact that both teaching. One of the best profs we had, adjunct professors we had, was Pastor Jeff, and you're not surprised by that. And it was such a, a I'll tell you, we're not happy with you. When you took him away from us, he had a full slate of classes to be taught at the university, and we loved it. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, you're still on my schedule. Uh, I'm the department chair, so I schedule all the classes. And uh, you're still on that schedule. I know he's not coming back, but it makes me feel better to see Jeff Doris' name still on the schedule with all the classes that he did teach and, and, and such. So anyway, that's, that's all good. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Because notice... If only in Christianity do we have a relationship of grace, not of works, not of condition, not an if. We have a grace relationship by which we're adopted children here at the baptism font. And this adoption holds, not because I'm perfected or promising more. Isn't that a completely set apart idea? We have a gracious God who forgives on the basis of his work, not ours. That's our relationship. Isn't that a marvelous, wonderful difference? And that's, sometimes we forget because the law is so in us, isn't it? The idea that, well, he'll be good to me because I, if I, when I, yeah. got to push that way. It's, it's deep, yeah. So C.S. Lewis uh, picked up on this. And, and, and the reason I think it's important for us to just explore this is because deep down I think all of us have what Pat expressed and it's, a, it's unfortunate because it's a very um, it can be a very uh, painful um, and almost damaging approach 
and, and I'll use the Bible story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Sure. Um, they started in the morning trying to get their God to be motivated to do what they wanted their God to do. Yeah. And by noon, it, Elijah became a little bit, you know, sarcastic. And yeah. by afternoon, it was pretty much embarrassing. And, right. and I share that with you because I think if we are Christians, we've got to come to grips with one of the real simple truths. There is a God. I'm not that God. <laughs> Right. And yet this God has brought me into relationship by grace. And this relationship is perfected already, but it's going to be patiently worked out what his will is for my life. Absolutely. That I'm still discovering. And, and it is a discovery. Right. And the Lord's Prayer becomes an opportunity to discover his will. Is that, mm -hmm. am I overstating yeah. this? So, so both uh, thy will be done, as so beautifully said by the lady there, his will, he, he knows that what she's going to do. He knows also what we're going to do, but I'm still discovering that. I'm being led as a child or as a sheep led by the shepherd, but the shepherd knows where he's going. The sheep is still discovering as we follow along. This, this lady is, I bet, going to continue that same idea of the will. You know, I never looked at it in terms of a patient relationship, but when you pray to God, sometimes he says yes. Right. Sometimes he says no. And a lot of times he says wait. Right. Exactly. We'll get to that. And, and here it is, if I may. And when I'm in that relationship, and one of my questions here was, when does the relationship itself become the prayer? You know, if I'm in an instant perfection model with God, what I want from God is the vending machine results. I, I, I want to put in my token and get the stuff. But in a patient relationship model, it's the relationship itself that I'm really after. Oh, I still want to be healed. I still want this. I still want that. But aren't you really after the relationship? I don't care. If, if Dad and I were pounding out a fender or rebuilding a carburetor and 5 o'clock came and it was time to be done and we weren't done, was that a bad day? No, I meant we got to tomorrow go back and, and keep going. In fact, after the eight years, I got to tell you, when we finished and we, there was nothing more to be done and they're not perfect, but they were done, it was kind of sad. It's kind of sad to say, well, we're done. No, we just drive them, but we're done. It was, it was the building more than the doing, the having. Yeah, Gladys. I think the thing that we don't always think about with the Lord's Prayer is the fact of control. Yeah. We as human beings want control. And, yeah. and that's what God teaches us. You know what? I'm God. You're not. <laughs> You're not get over it. Right, exactly. You know? But even though I'm God and you're not, we have a relationship. Exactly, and that's more important. Right. That is more important than quick, get it done. Exactly. You know, oh, here's the prayer, here's the miracle, it's done, all right, now you're on your way. No, no, he wants that time together. Exactly. He almost wants us to, I don't know if this sounds right, struggle mm -hmm. so that we have him to work with us on that struggle. Exactly. Because he knows we're going to struggle with it. Right. And, and he's right there going, you can do this. You can right. do this. It's like our kids. Right. When we watch our kids do something, you know, we know they're not going to jump up and walk. But we watch them. You know, I, I remember watching my youngest daughter at nine months old going, this is impossible. <laughs> she stood up on the couch and she saw that Christmas tree. And, and she's she going to go for that tree. to that Christmas tree. And she <laughs> did it. One little shaky foot at a time. But yeah, I wanted to get in there and help her, but it was like, no. This is her, sure. and there's, it was just, I, I remember that. Yeah. Just thinking, you know, God's like that with us. Yeah. One He's like, he one. knows that we have this glittery thing that we see and we want that. Yeah. And he's like, and you can get it. Right. When it's the right time. Right time. And right now may not be the right time. Exactly. And that's the hard part for us because we right. don't want to wait. We want it right now. Right. But God's like, you, you, you don't need it right now. I'll, I'll give you the analogy real quick that I, we use in class for exactly your point, Gladys. It's the two men who went to the temple to pray. Remember the Pharisee went up to the front and said, God, I thank you, you did not make me like other men. 
And then he lists out all the qualities that he has. And he assumes that he's a perfect match to God, like this. And then I asked, because I live with 20-year-olds, let's make a match.com ad, all right? And would you describe the ideal self, which is all of you? Uh, and what are you, who are you? And so then they say, oh, well, handsome, beautiful, tall, athletic, brilliant, uh, pre-med, pre-lawyer, you know, something, not usually Lutheran school teacher, there's no money in that, so, you know, it's a lovely thing, but it's not, it, you probably wouldn't put that on your thing. Uh, loves the outdoors, you know, here's a picture of your Subaru, the kayak, and the black lab puppy, uh, you know, and then I say, so when you have that, who are you looking for? You know, the other half of the ad, very, very simple, who are you looking for? The same, aren't you looking for the same, right? Your photo in the Match.com ad is a Subaru, a kayak, a black lab puppy. Are you looking for some woman or man who hasn't seen the sun in five years? No, and hates the outdoors, and is allergic to everything that's ever been made. No, no, you're looking for a match, right? Isn't that simple? I said, it makes sense. And all of us who've been in a relationship know that this kind of match makes Friday night a lot simpler. What do you want on your pizza? What movie are we gonna watch? Right, there you go, if we're, if we're like this. And then I say, how many times have you seen somebody walk down our Concordia hallways, a couple holding hands like this? Nah. But there's a whole lot of this. And what I'm not, you are. And what I'm not, you fill. And where I'm empty, you're there. And isn't that the other man who said, have mercy on me, a sinner? Not because God is a sinner as bad as he is, but because God is righteous and he fills the gap that is us. Isn't that a difference? And so we can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe matching the perfection of God, but we can be taken up by what he is and we are not. There you go, patient relationship. Now. It's 11.05, and we're going to give 10-minute break so you didn't lose up half of your break. Wait, no, Pastor Jeff is going to now eat up some of your break. <laughs> Don't blame me, man. I was going to give you the whole 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, once we're finished, we're going to have a great, uh, phenomenal lunch. However, some of you, and you might be noted by the droopy eyes didn't get full leaded coffee um, because some of us went ahead of you. Look at me, aren't I awake? So, um, so, so for those of us that did get fully leaded coffee, if we just hold back a bit and let those that, we'll let the others go first. Okay. We're not gonna be like those five-year-olds that run, I'm first, I'm first, and let people that wanna get a little coffee, if you want leaded, there is more leaded out there. And, um, and then we'll come back together and there'll be music playing. That's right, so in 10 minutes, music will play. Go, go, go get some coffee.
thank you so much. Come on in. And Steve, thank you so much. And we're, we're going to come together. Oh, just as you're settling in, I'll, I'll tell you a story about Butternut. Uh, you know it's a small town when Bertha and Ella, Bertha and Ella, these are real names. Bertha and Ella are sisters, and um, Ella lives across the street from us, Bertha a few miles away. They are the, the, the absolute stalwarts of the congregation. We had three services a weekend. Bertha and Ella worked the narthex between the 8 and the 9.30 service, and uh, but Ella lived across the street from us. Ella was in her 80s, and when we went home to farm, uh, to combine oats with dad, uh, I knew that the next morning when I got back after that week, 8 o'clock Monday morning, and remember, remember there's no cell phones, no call ID, no nothing. The phone rang, you picked it up, you, you know, because who knows who it could be. And uh, so uh, 8 o'clock Monday morning after we got back from combining, I knew the phone would ring, and this is Ella. And I'd pick up the phone and said, hello, it's Pastor Pablo. Pastor? Yeah, hi Ella. Is that you? Yeah, it, it's me. You're there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, Ella. I'm here. So you're back. Yeah, yeah, we're back. Holly came back with you? Yes, yeah, yeah Holly came back with me. And the kids? Yeah, yeah, the kids. So you're all there now. Yeah, we're all here now, Ella. Good. Because when you're gone, there's nothing to watch in this town. That's, that's when you know you live in a 400-person town. Oh, God bless Ella and Bertha. Bertha, Ella, and their, their brother, Albert. Albert, also single. Uh, he was their chauffeur. And it was just, you know, you, you all were out there. When is it time to start church? When Albert pulls in with his red Chevy Citation, if anybody remembers one of those. And Bertha, Ella, and Albert are here. Okay, we can start church now. That's pretty much per, per much it. All right. Um, oh, it's, uh, wonderful. I'd be glad to do it. Some of you have asked what I'll sign the, the books. I'll be happy to do that, and we can do that. Just catch me right away as we're going out. And uh, again, CPH also wants to say thank you so much to you, to Pastor, and, and to uh, the leadership for buying so many of the books. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, I did write three other books after that, uh, after this one, and uh, CPH would love you to, to take a look at those too. Uh, I, I can't help with uh, uh, you know, give the, uh, the, the, the by the way, CPH, they're wonderful people to work with. I've just loved it. Um, I'll say a, the, the name, Laura Lane, is the editor for all the books I've written, and she is just a marvelous young woman. And uh, so here's to all the good folks in St. Louis at CPH. But uh, we thank you for that. Questions? We, we're going to do our next two, and we're going to be right on time. We got our next two uh, sections. But any questions now, because this is a wonderful time, if you have a question or a comment that you wanted to clarify with, no? If we're ready to go, then we've got two more. Oh, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, right, right. As you're turning to it, you'll see uh, we have two more, I think, uh, expectations that we bring with our prayers, expectations of God. I was curious in light of what you've been teaching today, uh, when and why were the non-biblical endings of the Lord's Prayer added. Oh, you mean the line is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I, do, I wish I had my no. Greek text with me. I could give you a more uh, exact dating. And I remember right, and Jeff, you could run and get me a Nestle text and we, we'd see it, but they appear in the Matthew uh, uh, version and they're probably from the fourth, I think the earliest manuscripts we have are probably in the fourth or fifth century, where the earliest complete manuscripts of the New Testament, circa late 200s, early 300s, so third, fourth century, do not have those closing words. As you know, our Roman Catholic friends don't include them in their saying of the prayer. That'll always trip you up when you're a Lutheran visiting at a Catholic church, and you keep going, uh, and, and such. So it depends on which manuscript you, you read. If you follow the earliest manuscripts, you can certainly end at, as they did, at, uh, for the of the King, or excuse me, without for the of the kingdom, power and the glory. There are many manuscripts, though, that have them. I don't think they're, they're wrong. We've always included them liturgically. And generally, we'll find them in the, you know, added on the bottom of the Bible text. Many manuscripts include these words, as we have in many cases. So, why, oh, why were they added? 
Well, well, yeah. a, How does that relate in terms of the rest of the prayer? Oh, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think Why? it's an echo. I think it's an echo of that hallowed be thy name. It makes a, if we have this journey imagery, we said thy name. And can we say more of that name and its qualities? For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Are those qualities or locations for that name that we started? In the book, and again, I don't want to take away from the pastors, I talk about joining the choir. And when we say, hallowed be thy name, you've joined the heavenly choir. And as we come to the end of that journey, these are the steps we're taking in mind as we're returning to heaven. What are they singing? Well, let's at least imagine that part of the unending chorus of saints and angels is for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, whether that was the fourth century first writer's imagery, I, I, we don't know. But I think it works in terms of the journey. We started with name, we end with the qualities of his name. Yeah, thank you. This gentleman. Um, I was telling my wife that I wish you had a, a national uh, radio or television program. <laughs> and the reason because um, we need a good replacement for Billy Graham. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm, Billy I'm is far beyond my... I, I've got a lot from... You know, the big thing is, you know, I don't even know what church he belonged to, really. A Billy? But a the ba thing is, what he said in the end, join a good Bible-based sure, church. Sure, sure. You know? I mean, he didn't say be a Mormon or be a whatever. Right. O only this one denomination. Yeah. It's funny you were mentioning, I was telling Holly this yesterday, that uh, I grew up in a home that watched every Billy Graham crusade. My parents never missed Billy. And I don't, I don't know if you know, but his magazine was called Decision Magazine, came every month to our farmhouse. And uh, I think my mother sent money, uh, you know, and, and, and such. So I grew up with a, a very lively appreciation of Billy Graham. D who cannot remember holding a Bible in one hand and and saying, the Bible says, and his signature trademark, and may all Lutheran preachers do the same, as I'm sure they do, and hold the Bible and say simply, directly, and the Bible says, in our confused world, what a wonderful, simple message that we can still give. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to address, and we'll talk more about this uh, as the summer goes on, looking at... You know, there are differences even between Matthew and Luke's prayer beyond yes, right. that. Mm -hmm. But for those that may have wondered what Doctor was talking about in terms of manuscripts, many of us may not be aware that there's not like one right. manuscript of the Bible. Um, there are New Testament manuscripts. There are literally, I, I, I'm going to just conjecture hundreds, hundreds, hundreds yeah. maybe even thousands of different manuscripts that are partially have been discovered in different parts of the world. And, and of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls being um, uh, discovered have opened our eyes to a lot of that. But it's a good question, mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about that over the summer. Sure, sure. That's a wonderful topic. And uh, under the greater heading of why are there so many Bibles and so many versions that we have, but, but the good news about those many hundreds of manuscripts is that there's no central doctrine that is in any way endangered by the variant readings. There's, the, there's no manuscript that says, no, Jesus didn't rise. No, no, no. Uh, absolutely, the, uh, the core is always there. And it's, it's some of the interesting you know, differences, uh, they do make for interesting reading and saying, oh, okay. But uh, the central uh, text is always secure. All right, I'm going to go on with our top of uh, the next page. Uh, perfection welcomes failure. As you see, we have two images yet uh, that uh, we want to touch on. And one is that perfection welcomes failure. I'd like you to ponder those three words. I hope that they are a little striking in your mind, a little outside our usual experience. And for that, I need to tell you the story of Nurse Reichardt. 
Uh, I have a wonderful friend, Brenda Job. She's a nursing professor, and I needed a, um, a story to illustrate this point. And so I went to my dear friend, Brenda, and I said, Brenda, now this would never happen to any of you nurses. It's a whole, we have a whole school of nursing, so we have a whole hallway of nursing profs. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And I said, but Brenda, just imagine that you're a new nurse on the floor. What's the worst thing? Not the worst. I don't want to kill anybody, but I mean, what would be a bad mistake that you could make as a new nurse and uh, Brenda thought for a moment and she said well what if you're on the maternity ward and you're taking care of the moms and the babies and you're so new that you spent an eight hour shift and you only took care of the moms and you never checked in on the babies because you thought that was somebody else's job and so you just took great care of the moms. You gave them their tests and their vitals and you recorded everything. And at the end of the eight hour shift when you pull up and I forget what her name for the, the record keeping system, uh, Epic, does that sound right? It is Epic. And, and by the way, when they say it, it's sort of with a scowl. <laughs> we hate Epic. Uh, and, and anyway, anyway, she said when you're there filling out the chart on Epic, you suddenly realize, oh, I never checked on the babies. At that moment, Nurse Reichardt comes down the hall. This is our image of Nurse Reichardt. She has owned this hall for 30 years. She's six foot one. Her hair is tied back. She wrote the, ma and, 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 and doctor, I forget, you'll, you would know it, but Brenda said the operations manual, she had a better name for it. She wrote it herself, carving it into tablets of stone. The doctors dare not leave the floor until she gives them permission. That's Nurse Reichardt. Are you picturing Nurse Reichardt? All right, Katerina Reichardt. We Google it to make sure that it doesn't exist anywhere, famously. Nurse Reichardt comes down the hall at that moment. At that moment, you know that she knows something's wrong. You know, there's a disturbance in the force here, in her world. What do you want to do? You're a brand new nurse. You've been on the floor two weeks, straight out of Concordia. And we train really good nurses, but it happens, you know. What, what's your inclination? Are you going to run towards her or away from her? Away, exactly. Look at all of you. Said, are you crazy? You're going away. By the way, your door, the door you're facing is the one that says, alarm will sound if you open it. What are you going to do? <laughs> open it and keep running. Absolutely. Because what does perfection do? It repels failure. You, you see perfection, Nurse Reichardt coming down the hallway, and you know you're a failure. Where are you going to go? The other way. Isn't that just our nature? Run the other way. Okay, quick. Nurse Reichardt's story, fictional. At least Brenda tells me it's fictional. But there's such a ring of truth. I always wondered if it really happened to Brenda uh, when she was a new nurse. What's the biggest mistake you could make in your job? Have you had a, a, a Nurse Reichardt moment where you're new to the job and I don't know what you were thinking. You weren't thinking. And oh my gosh, and what did you do? Did anybody, none of you ever have messed up ever at work, ever, at the first job. Yeah, oh, Gladys, there you go. All right, so I do communications. And um, one of the first churches I was communications in, and I was writing the newsletter. And right. I get the newsletter, and on the front page, we have a new vicar coming, okay? And That's it's good. exciting. And they have a pantry party that they're going to have for the new vicar. Right. If you leave one letter out of the word pantry, oh, this was yeah. on the front page and nobody checked it for me. Oh. So I had people literally calling the office just laughing, <laughs> just <laughs> laughing. And after that, now the vicar, when he got there, he loved, it said panty party. Uh huh. <laughs> so that was eh, not good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So this vicar, he he took it on himself to help me out after. Oh, that. he did. Yeah, Wasn't it good? He he had me get red pens, and he would go through and and find mistakes in. All oh, there. Oh, after so thereafter, that. it never happened again. Well, no, I mean, yeah, but, but what? no, but that was that was my. Not that exactly. Oh my gosh. And then to show up. 
the next Sunday at church. That took courage <laughs> to, to still go to church, you know, and say, because otherwise you said, couldn't we just go someplace and do something, you know, and at the moment that you mess up. Well, um, I'll tell you, the, the Cindy Freeman was from South Carolina. She grew up her entire life as a Baptist here in South Carolina, and because she and her husband worked for the Forest Service, they got transferred up to, guess where, Butternut. She had the most wonderful Southern Carolina accent. Oh, it's this beautiful thing. Have you ever noticed that people speak of the beauty of a South Carolina or a Southern accent. No one has ever said that a Wisconsin accent is a beautiful thing to hear. Nobody has ever said that, and they never will. I just, I know. Anyway, Cindy went to work at our public school, which is a half a block from our church and our house with Parsonage, and she gave the morning announcements in the most beautiful Southern drawl you could ever hear in far northern Wisconsin. Good morning, y'all. I can't do it. I can't do it. But anyway, she there she was. Well, one day, the administrator was leaving, and I thought, oh, I should go over and say goodbye to the, church, the school administrator. I knew him and been there a few, year, few years. So I called up the school, and Cindy answered. She was a member of ours. And I said, Jay, you know, is the administrator still there? I wanted to come by and say, you know, goodbye. Oh, she said, yeah, we're having a party right now for him. Come on over. So I went over to the school. Again, it's, it's half a block away. It's, it's right where your parking lot is, is right where the school was. So I walk in. I go down, aim for the hallway. And Cindy is standing in the hallway. And there's the whole staff, you know, faculty lounge where everybody is having their party. She looks at me. And she turns and says to everybody in through the open door, quick, everybody, put your clothes back on. Pastor Pablo is coming. <laughs> It takes a lot of guts to walk in after that. I'll tell you what. And by the way, they're all fine. They look all like you. They're holding a kilo, you know, can of soda and a piece of cake. And, uh, but you got to walk in. Well, failure repels us. As a failure, I'm running away from perfection. Unless perfection ends the story a different way. See, the way you're expecting Nurse Reichardt to end that story is to catch you before you make it through that door. The door won't open. Somehow she has a remote control on that. And you're trapped. And she drags you over. But what if it ended this way? And again, I give my wonderful friend Brenda credit for this. What if we ended the story this way? And Nurse Reichardt, sensing something's wrong, comes up and notices that half of your form is not filled out. And she says something like, it's sure been a busy shift, hasn't it? Oh, I know you've done such a good job. Why don't we take one last look at those babies before you go? I'll do half of them, you do the other half so you can get going. How do you feel about Nurse Reichardt now? Oh, fantastic. And when others complain about how demanding she is, what are you going to say? She cares. She, she saved me. She didn't say a word. Well, except the words that saved me, and you've got a friend for life. And instant perfection, absolute perfection, attracts failures. And that's what we have with God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. If you're handy with your text, run with me to Hebrews chapter 4. And isn't this an amazing idea? Hebrews chapter 4, and my fingers are so slow, we're somewhere around 1189. Thank you. 1189. Hebrews chapter 4. Would somebody give us just verses 14 to 16? Page 1189, verses 14 to 16. Absolute perfection welcomes failure, attracts failure. Uh, 14 to 16 of Hebrews chapter 4. Page 1189. Should say, since then we have a great high priest. Who's got it? George is ready to go. Thank you, George. Or Dave. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Perfect. 
What, pers what perspective of God, what expectation of God do you have when you pray? If it is a forbidding perfection, an absolute, that repels failures like us, will you even pray? Probably not. We'll run for the door. But isn't it amazing that the one who is absolutely perfect, and remember, not just perfect in a brittle, untouched state, but the one who is absolutely perfect being tempted in everything as we are. So there's nothing we can say, well, you know, if you'd ever had to really put up with the people I put up with, you ever had to do the things I have to do, if you ever had done to you what was done to me, then you wouldn't be so perfect. And then before we get done saying that, of course, we know, but he was like me. He was put upon. And no, I've never been crucified. And he was. So when his absolute perfection has endured far more than you and I ever have, isn't it amazing that he welcomes us, that his perfection draws us? That's why we pray. We pray because his perfection welcomes the failures that each one of us is. And that's where we have that, that wonderful man, the, the thief on the cross, who says, remember me when you come into your kingdom? That man's another failure, isn't he? But he knows that perfection, dying right next to him, will wel welcome a failure like himself. That's why we love the thief, don't we? That's why we love the tax collector who still dared to come to the temple and prayed, have mercy on me, a sinner, knowing that he was miserable and God was perfect and yet they made a perfect match. So this gentleman had a comment. So what I find remarkable in the Lord's Prayer is that Jesus identifies with us. He doesn't need daily bread. He no. doesn't need forgiveness of sins. Right. You know, he was tempted, but he was without sin. Yes. So he just identifies. It's not like my father. It's our father. It's exactly. identification. And, and to build on that wonderful point that you make, he doesn't need bread. He can go 40 days without it. Yet what is his signature? Number one, first I am. He has seven I am's that define who he is. I am the bread of life. Isn't that amazing? He's not unapproachable wisdom, which he is. I'm not searing perfection, which he is. I'm bread. The bread, exactly. And when, when we define him, as the one who feeds us, what miracle is the only miracle in all four Gospels? Feeding the 5,000. Isn't that remarkable? I fed them. you got to hear that over and over and over and over. It's the only miracle in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. So that's a fantastic point. So if we have a God of perfection who welcomes failures like us and all the more says, so pray. So pray to a father who already knows what you need and yet asks, why are you so worried? and welcomes us to say what we're worried about. Absolute perfection welcomes failures, failures like us. We'll turn the page to one last one and one last image, and that is picking rocks. We picked rocks on the farm for a week. It took a week to go through all the fields, and I mean, there's just, some of you are nodding your heads, and you know, there's nothing, we did not have a mechanical rock picker. We had the four of us, my sister, my mom, my dad, and me, and you just walk up and down the fields picking up rocks, anything about this size on, and putting it on the, on the wagon. And you did that for a week. My mother, after said of rock picking, this just, just drove my mom nuts to have to do this, but we have to. Mom said, if after five minutes of picking rocks, there's anything about this job that either amuses you or confuses you, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and that pretty well summed it up. So we picked rocks for a week. Now, it's easy to pick up rocks that are this size. You know, that's not the problem. But sometimes you've got the big ones. You know, the frost. Frost, what a concept for South Carolina. There's this thing called frost and uh, where the ground freezes. The frost keeps shoving the big rocks up also. And eventually, you have to deal with the big ones. So we would take a stone boat. I don't know if you know what that's. Uh, just a flat bed of, of uh, boards being towed behind a tractor. And you would take crowbars and uh, lever that rock out of the hole on to the stone boat and then cart it away or drag it away. And um, what would happen as you're levering that big rock? I mean, it'd be the size of the, the baptism font here. You're levering that, and it's me and dad, we each have a crowbar. Crowbars are six feet long. And you're a little guy, and you're holding it while dad's repositioning his. If you slip, where's that rock going to go? 
back into the hole. It's going to go back in the hole even though you promised it all kinds of adventures. And it's going to see new sights and have new friends. See, you've been picking rocks for a week. You're starting to talk to the rock. You're getting a little buggy by now. It's going to go right back into the hole despite all your promises. Does that sound like our inclination? When God makes gracious promises of change in our life, where do we and where do biblical people often want to go? Back in the hole, back in the rut. Best example. Slaves for 400 years, the people of Israel get brought out of slavery by Moses. When times get tough in the, in the Sinai Desert, where do they want to go? Right back into the hole. Like that's a good fit. Like that's going to be a good thing. But isn't that our nature? Do we carry on that nature in other ways? That we simply want to be back in the hole. When you pray, do you sometimes pray for the newness that grace will lead or do you want just to be left alone and be put back in the same place? Oh, God, can you just put me back where I was? Could you just make it the way it used to be? There's not a one of us that doesn't want to fall back in a hole. Just leave me be. Don't move me. Don't change. And grace, as so often, wants to lever us out of that hole and promise us something better. Why is that frightening? Why is that not our eager response to prayer and to the offer of God. Why do we want to fall back in the hole? Gladys, you're ready. I like that smile. Well, we know how to deal with the hole. Exactly. I've been there for so long, I know what to do. I, and, I, and I've been ducking and covering and hiding here, you know? And so just leave me be. Why else are we afraid of the offer of grace? Yeah. No one else. Exactly, because you're the only one, it seems, who's being levered out. Everybody else gets to duck and cover and hide. Why should I have to do it? Doesn't that sound like a petulant thought? Why do I have to do this? Ah, my brothers aren't doing it. My sister's not doing it. Why me? Ah, we're afraid that what if we make a change or we see God making a change in our life, even though that change is one prompted by his mercy and his offer of grace, that... It'll not turn out. And I can't go back because, as you noted, you can't go back. Once you've destroyed Pharaoh and the army, do you think the Egyptians are going to welcome you back? I don't think so. And, or that you're going to have the same old place in the same old way. So we know that sometimes when God makes a change, there is no going back to the life as it was. And so we rebel against that wonderful change, even though we offer, we're offered so much more. So one last picture. We've had lots of dogs and cats in our, our family, and uh, we had a beagle that lived till 15 years old, and uh, loyal, but not bright. That's, I would sum up a beagle that way. Absolutely loved Holly, and barely tolerated the rest of us. That was as, as well, after Abby had died, Abby the beagle, 15 years, um, we had about a two-week hiatus, and we had leftover dog food in the garage. You know, it's, I mean, and one night, one of the kids left the garage door open, which is just anathema to me, close the garage door, people. I went out there, and as I was closing the garage door, you know, boom, an orange flash goes barreling out of our garage. As a cat who had been drawn in by the dog food that was still a little bit, you know, a little scattered here and there. What in the world? Well, we started seeing this stray cat, bright orange, uh, around our place and realized that he was living in the row of spruce trees right next to us. And it's now September and winter's coming really soon in Wisconsin. And this, this stray thrown out cat is trying to live there and it's not going to make it. So our daughter began to feed him, and he would eat, and she would get a little close. And finally, we got to decide, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because this, this cat's not going to live through winter, even just being fed out here. So one day, we finally said, all right, put out the food, and we grabbed the cat to take it to the vet to have it checked, and we'll, so we're going we're to keep this cat, okay? Let the rodeo begin. 
Have you ever tried to hold a 10 pound terrified cat in your hands with all its claws and teeth? Oh my gosh, it should be national uh, finals rodeo. It should be an event, uh, cat wrestling. So we got it in a box, it came out, we stuffed it back in the box, we took it to the vet. Now I'm armed. I did not have leather gloves on when I first did it because I didn't want to scare the kitty. Well, forget that. Uh, when we take the cat out of the box, I got the vet standing right there. I'm going to take the box that we said, now this cat's just going to explode out of the box. So I'm armed, and the vet says, all right, take him out. And I go in and open the door, or open the box. Meek little kitty. And I look like a fool because I got all my big gloves on. I was like, all right, here, fine, all right. So Rocky, we named him Rocky because he looked like an orange rocket going out the door. Rocky was a mess. $500 worth of vet bills for a straight, I know, I know. My father would have gone, you got to be kidding. You're not going to do that. But anyway, we brought Rocky home. Now, Rocky hid under the couch, under beds for about the first week. He was just so scared. And what do we keep telling Rocky? Come on out. It's okay. He had been a pet somewhere, sometime. He understood litter boxes. He knew food. And after a while, he started to come out because grace had upended his world. And he began to trust. Best cat. Some of the best pet we ever had. Rocky was wonderful, and I tell you that because I'm tearing up because, you see, Abby the Beagle loved Holly. Rocky loved me. <laughs> me and Rock, we were like this. He was nice to everybody else, but me and Rock, he, we were tight and absolutely wonderful. And so grace upends our world. Rocky put up a fight. I think that's so a picture of us at times. We're, we're resistant and all our claws are out. But God is persistent, patient, and promises nothing bad's going to happen. I know it's different. I know it's not what you're used to. But look, Rocky, you don't want to be out there in that 40 degrees rain. You're inside. And he was. Rocky lived with us for over five years. You could leave the front door open all day. Rocky would never, ever once go outside. He'd been outside. Life was better in here. You know, yes, sir, and he stayed with us. So may we remember Rocky when both perfection welcomes our failure and the grace of God invites a change that at first appears frightening to us and we're maybe inclined to bolt and run, but instead God promises us the very best. So maybe those are perceptions that we can bring to our prayers and... Uh, Maybe we should close by, if that's all right, well, Lord's Prayer. Question. Oh, questions, absolutely, questions. The prospect of lunch has had an effect on the questions. <laughs> 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 Happens in all my classes, I can tell you that, absolutely. Um, we have lots of question time. I'm going to just, I'll be right there. I'll sign, you know, the books and, and all. But uh, I, I think we have a, a closing uh, by Dave and, and announcements. There we go. So thank you very, very much for the chance to be here. We'll be here on tomorrow uh, with both sermons and then also Bible class in between. But this was a, a wonderful event. Holly and I, again, thank you so very much for letting us come. And uh, it's been lovely to be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I wanted to, on behalf of the congregation and definitely myself and Laura, we really appreciate your style and uh, your storytelling and the analogies and to bring the stories home. And uh, is that better? Okay. Uh, so we want to thank you for spending the time. I know it's been a long journey and, uh, and you and Holly, uh, you really... I think it's a great kickoff to the uh, sermon series that will be coming up, and I hope everyone is like I am, and I want to get you know into more detail on the book. And I've already read it once, so I want to. I think I'll relearn that. But uh, the analogy is bringing home, and you're uh, staying in the grounded in the Word and helping us get closer to the Lord. I appreciate that. Uh, Kevin will close us in prayer for this session. And he'll also pray for the food that we're about to consume. And uh, when we get in there, uh, before we go full-blown on the food, uh, Jeff and I will probably have a, a few more comments. Uh, but I'd like to thank all of you for coming. 
uh, and eventually, um, I don't know if Jeff has any more comments, but Jeff? Just, um, Debbie, uh, you've probably seen her. She's kind of like um, Flash, whoosh, running through here like crazy, trying to make everything perfect in there. And um, um, she's invited us to sit down and start eating. That's why we're praying in here. So for those of you that are like, cannot eat until you pray, we're praying in here. So we're going to start eating in the salad, and then um, Dave is going to uh, uh, bring Debbie up. She's going to give us some instructions, and of course, have opportunity to say thank you to all those that have worked. There's, um, we ordered um, food. Um, there, we're going to make it work. If you, if anybody wants to um, find some fish and loaves, um, um, and and can call on Jesus, but we should have plenty. Um, come and uh, grab a seat and. Um, and I would encourage you to look for people to sit with that maybe you don't know so we can get to know one another um, because some of us have been here for a long time. Some of us are new. And there's not enough seats to sit with Holly and Dan. So, so find somewhere else to sit and bring your book over and he'll be happy to sign your book and talk to you a little bit more. They're great people and Mary and I are blessed to consider them friends. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you so much for, for Dan and for Holly to come all this way um, to uh, bless us with their presence. And we thank you so much for Dan's wonderful presentation. And we thank you that we get to grow together and walk together in faith as we learn, uh, continue to learn what you would have us understand in, in the Lord's Prayer, that blessed gift of prayer that you show us, and we thank you for that. Um, we ask for your blessing over this food today, over our, our time and fellowship continued together, and do we rejoice in the, in the grace you always give us. Uh, Lord, remember us in the, your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.